It's my pleasure now to introduce the Founders Memorial Award Lecture. This award was established in 1958 to honor the memories of scientists who made outstanding contributions to the field of entomology. I quite literally could not be happier to introduce Dr. Bernard Lewis. Dr. Lewis is internationally recognized for his pioneering research on dry wood termite biology detection and control. During his nearly 40 year career, he has authored and co-authored more than 150 refereed and trade magazine articles and book chapters on termites and household insect pests. He began his career in 1982 as a staff entomologist with IPM Systems in the San Francisco Bay Area. After earning his BS in Agricultural Sciences in 1975 and his MS in Entomology in 1979, both at UC Berkeley, he later worked in vector control at San Quentin State Prison while also pursuing his PhD in Entomology, which he received in 1989, again at UC Berkeley. Dr. Lewis was then hired as a postdoc fellow at UC Berkeley and joined the faculty as an extension specialist in 1991 advising pest management professionals and the public on household pests. At the time of his hire, he was the first black faculty member at UC Berkeley's Rosser College of Natural Resources. A year before his retirement in 2017, Dr. Lewis was inducted into the National Pest Management Association Hall of Fame. And today, he continues to volunteer his time on university and industry committees and public boards dedicated to increasing diversity, equity and inclusion for underrepresented minorities and women in STEM careers. Please help me welcome Dr. Bernard Lewis. Thank you so much. Am I on? Oh, good. Uh, I, I am truly humbled and, and honored to, to give this talk today. It's uh, to talk about the incredible career of Dr. Margaret Collins, and I, I, I'm gonna jump into this because I have a lot to cover. Can I click this? Does it advance? Uh oh, ah, all right. So uh, in my talk today, I have to give you an outline. So I'm gonna start off with child prodigy. I will next mention university training, academic career, woman in science, that's gonna be a wild section, by the way, giving you a heads up. And then, of course, legacy. I'm not quite sure how this thing is. Ah, child prodigy. So, uh, Margaret was born Margaret James in 1922 in Institute, West Virginia. Now, I have, back in the day, women had to, when they, they got married, they took men's name. Now, we do it different today. But remember, Margaret was born in 1922. So, so when, when you track her through time, you have to remember, you have to go through several names. Her, her father, Rollins, was a prof at uh, the, the, the University uh, of West Virginia. Now, now you have to remember, uh, this is during the segregation in the South. This is a black university. So in fact, this is a black town. So a black town filled with educated black folks. So it's, it's, it's a different, different world back then. Her mom, uh, Luella, also went to college. She didn't graduate. Remember back then for women, women of color, they didn't have the same opportunity. So her opportunity was her children. And she's proud to do it and she did a fantastic job. Margaret was the youngest, well, was the fourth youngest of five children. She spent most of her time outside. Now this is a rural setting. So there's water, there's creeks, there's streams. And Margaret spent her time out there a lot. Maybe she didn't have all the supervision. Uh, her mom was sick. So Margaret had free realm. I doubt anyone's left alive today who remembers Margaret when she was a child. And I asked her family if I could get a picture or something that would kind of best represent Margaret during this time frame. And here it is, here's Margaret at 10 on an American painted horse, bareback, 
Look at her face. That's a determined face. When I look at this image, this image to me screams, look out world, here I come. So that's Margaret in a nutshell as, as a young girl. Now, remember she, she was raised in a university family. She read everything. She read all the books, and her dad had a lot of books. He was a prof you know, at, at HBCU. She read the neighbor's books. She read encyclopedias. Everything she should, could get her hands on. Now, I think some of us out there, our family, have, have young children at home. So when your children read a lot, and please, please teach your children to read early and often, what comes with that reading are a lot of questions. And Margaret had a ton of questions. And that would, that's uh, good training for scientific careers, too. Um, she got skipped three grades. She graduated from high school at 14. <laughs> I didn't start high school until I was 15, right? So um, the, the, uh, and, and, uh, that's a picture of what that library looked like. Um, the other thing I put on there is that bullet point that says sci-fi, and then after it is SF light. Now, many of you out there don't know who this SF light person is. That was a prophet Cal back in the days, and now we're going back in the 30s and 40s. He was a zoologist, and uh, he wrote a, a magazine article, a fictional account of a man shrinking down to the size of an ant and what his life would be like. Margaret read that in high school. Now, here's, here's the important point here. S.F. Light studied, he was a zoologist at Cal, at Berkeley. But here's the important point. He studied protozoa in termites. So already, the wheels are turning at a young age. Now, um, Margaret got her first library card to a university at six. For comparison, I didn't get my first university card until I went to Laney College in Oakland. I was 19. She got hers at six. And the deal was, if she could reach the book on her tippy toes, she could grab it and take it home and read it. I mean, who does that? Amazingly talented woman. Uh, like I said, she read a lot, asked many questions. And, and th that image up there on the top is, is just, uh, that's a picture of, Looking at it, when I'm looking at it, it's on my left. That's Margaret and her, her uh, daughter-in-law, Veronica, and that's, that's her granddaughter. Maybe she's not quite six, but that's about what Margaret was, was like back in the day. So um, university training. And now here's the deal. When you're raised in an academic family, I mean, her father was a prof. The expectation is you go on to college, right? I don't care if you're six. 14, 21, you're going to college. So, uh, in particular, when it's just down the street. And that's where she went. She went to West Virginia Tech University, and that's a HBCU, historically black college and university. And, you know, for the record, during that era, yeah, they were separate, but they were never equal. We'll just leave it at that. Leave your imagination to work on that a little bit. So, she got up. Remember, she ran around in nature a lot, collecting bugs and all that. So. Of course, she, got a, she worked uh, to get a, a BS in biology. She minored in physics and German. Now, two minors. I mean, one major is tough enough, but to have two minors? And what's up with physics and German? Now, now you have to remember, this is, again, we're in the 40s. So uh, in the 40s, if you're into physics, you got to know some German. So that means she had to take German at a black university. Now, who teaches German at a black university? They found one white guy, actually, who was a German Jew, a refugee from Germany. He spoke German. He came to the United States. His name was Frederick uh, 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 Lingner. And uh, he couldn't get a job in the white universities because this was World War II. They're not going to hire someone to teach German. But he got one at, at the black university in uh, Institute, West Virginia the only white, university, uh, white person in the university in the town, Margaret finds him. And you have to think that she was a tall, striking woman, shoulders back. Remember, she's on that horse bareback. 
look out world, here I come, you're gonna teach me German. And uh, she won a scholarship to go here, you gotta pay money to go to college. But it wasn't enough, and she had to augment her years uh, at, at the institute. She worked as a maid, as a housekeeper. She even shot rats to bring them to the biology labs for dissections. She did what she had to do. Remember that, okay. She also got married during this era, at least her, uh, to Strickland. Okay, I'm not quite sure. Ah, all right, so she graduates. Now, for, remember her mom didn't graduate, for most women at that era, to go to college was a heck of an achievement, but Margaret wanted more. She wanted to go to graduate school and study everything she could about biology. HBCUs didn't have the graduate programs back then. You had to go elsewhere. She had to go to white institutions. That means leaving home, leaving her comfort zone. Actually, that meant leaving her husband for a little bit too, right? Because he's down, remember she was married and she had to go, so where do you go? Well, University of Chicago. Now that's a famous place, right? And some of you might, it's, uh, it was a, a religious school, private, so it didn't have to deal with that Jim Crow stuff. Some of you might remember Charles Turner, first Afro-American male to get a degree in entomology. He also went there. So this place had a track record. And you know, since Margaret read everything, she knew about this place. So she went there. Now, now to go there, she was provided a stipend. So, uh, you know, in her state, they gave her a stipend, $125 a year to go to college. Now, when I was an undergrad at Cal, I got four grand a year and thought that was tough, 125. Now, I know this was in the 40s, but still, that's not much. In her memoir, she mentions she had to limit herself to 10 meals a week, 10 meals a week. Normally, we eat three meals a day. Do the math, guys. Okay. So, uh, while she's registering orientation at the University of Chicago, because you got to sign, you all went to college, so you know you got to find a class to take. Uh, there was a, and she didn't know what to take, so this older gentleman said, you need to fill up your dance card, so take my course in zoology. Now, little did she know, this man was Alfred Emerson, the world's leading termite <clears throat> taxonomist. I would have loved to have been there to watch this epitome of a professor with a first encounter with this strong black woman. But sparks must have been flying. But that was the beginning of the relationship that would last a lifetime. So he took her in as, as her, uh, to work in his, he provided her work in his lab. And this was the perfect lab for her to work in, right? Because remember, she was running around in, in the wilderness in West Virginia now she's got someone who travels the world looking for termites, so this is a match made in heaven at $125 a year. It had to have been tough. Her husband got drafted. Her first husband got drafted. She's in Chicago by herself. The only black woman, young, like 20, in a grad program in mostly white classrooms, male. It had to have been tough on her, but Remember her on that horse, that determined face? She's gonna make it work. All right, she needed a thesis project. Now, um, she read a book. <clears throat> Emerson had an extensive library, and of course she read everything in it. A book called Termite City. And that's basically a book about termites in the Caribbean. She read that, she said she gotta have a termite project. That's what she would do. So what was her project? What she did, for the record, uh, at that time, people knew termites. Some lived in deserts, some lived in coastal areas, some lived in the tropics, but they didn't quantify the mechanisms that termites use for that tremendous variance in the environment. She was the first person to do it. How did she do it? She used a lot of glass jars and test tubes and subjected termites to different humidities. 
The way she controlled the humidities is with salts. And that led to her thesis. Right there. I, 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 uh, the thesis is obviously in the rare book collection at the University of Chicago, but trust me, you, online you can kind of look at the title so you know it's there. Now, um, I mentioned she was the first one to qualify uh, how termites tolerate dryness. Now, what Margaret really wanted was a field study. She ended up doing a lab study. Emerson said no. And as liberal and as nice a man he was, he didn't believe women should be out in the field. Now remember that, because later on she gets her wish. Remember, Margaret was determined. She's gonna get in the field one way or another. Now, her feat to get that PhD, I thought it was 1949, she was only the third Afro-American woman to get a degree, PhD degree in zoology. Actually, she was the first Afro-American woman to get a de PhD degree with an entomological title. That got her a lot of recognition. And, and if you go to the web, the, the picture you most often see is some rendition of this where she's at the AAAS meetings and they have this nice, and you can see she was a striking woman. Normally when you see this picture on the internet, it has a red stripe across the top, and, it, uh, and just to sh give you a little ethnic upbringing here, uh, Jet Magazine is known for its red stripe. Now, now, let me back up here and give you guys a little cultural history. I'm 70 years old, so I did, when I was growing up as a kid, I didn't read Life or Look or Reader's Digest. I read things like Ebony and Jet. These were magazines for black folk. I'm just telling it like it is. Ebony was for, for black folk who had dough and were sophisticated, right? Those of us who were cheap and less sophisticated read Jet. So Margaret gets featured in Jet and the scientific media. So she was a crossover. Now today we talk about crossovers in music and sports. Here's a black woman in the 50s, a crossover with the black and white community in science. Who does that? Maybe that's why she's being honored today. She's way ahead of her time. All right, seminal publications. Because remember, she's a scientist first. All right. So after her thesis, she, you know, 100 page thesis, whatever, you have to cut it down to a journal size. So her, her seminal publication was featured in Ecology, 1950s. So, and it's 15 pages long. And I think you can see what she looked at. Remember, she couldn't do a, a big field study like she wanted to do, but she could look at the local termites around Chicago. This is reticulate termites. She looked at three species. They were in different habitats, you know, around a lake, forested areas, and something in the more arid areas. And, and she did that thing where she looked at their tolerance to dryness. And so she was the first to, to quantify that. And, and to give you an idea, I think I brought the book here. Yeah, good, I'll bring this. This was the Bible for termite biologists starting in 1935. It's called Termites and Termite Control. They have a section and it's, okay, it's another one of those Berkeley pubs, that's another story. So, so uh, in here they talk about termites tolerance to drying. It's two pages, it's by Williams. Margaret cites that. It's a qualitative treatment. She quantified it, you know, where she actually took data on, on the different humidities for different species of termites. The, the other thing that happened in this paper, she cites women in this paper. This is 1950. She cites women. She uses the she pronoun in a scientific publication in 1950 way ahead of her time. Now I know we do pronouns differently today, but I'm just showing you what, what she was like. And I'll, you know, obviously I've met this Margaret, so let's, I'll tell you a little, I'll give you some Margaret stories. All right, now, another one of her seminal publications, she did a, a chapter in this book by Krishna and Wiesner. It's called uh, the, the Biology of Termite. It's a two volume book, very, very famous, at least in the world of termite folks. I, I want to focus on that name, Krishna and Wiesner, a little bit here. To, uh, unfortunately, oftentimes in science, we don't do, do justice to acknowledging the diversity of researchers out there. 
Krishna was from India. He was also one of Emerson's students. He knew Margaret. Wiesner was a woman, another woman. So, so when I get a chance to, 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 to point those out, I'm, I'm going to call them out. You know, because too often, I'm just, I've got to be fair. And Francis, another Berkeley grad. I'm just sorry, I'm going to bring that out there. So, so Margaret did the book chapter on water relations in termites. Now, that's a busy table, but remember when I showed you in her thesis, she looked at three termites. So in this book chapter, she looked at 25. So a much more global view, get it? You know, running all these groups of termites through different chambers. She did more than that, though. She also did dissections. Because you know, let's think about this. For termites to survive a, an arid environment, they better have a thicker cuticle. She did that. Now, now, there are some of her relatives left alive today who remember when she was doing that work. Thousands of dissections, not done by robots, not done by fancy machines, done by hand and looked at one of a time under a microscope. Incredible, incredible work. Uh, uh, Margaret had an incredible career. Uh, and it kind of lists, she was actually a lecturer at Howard University when she was a grad student at the University of Chicago. Then she went on to become a professor at, the, uh, at Florida a &M. Now these are all black universities because you know this is back in the day, I'm gonna call it out. You might wonder, well what's up with Howard in Florida? Florida said, at Florida a and they said, we want you as a woman, we want you to bring more women. Howard says something else. Howard was a little more elitist. I'll say more on that when we get to the bumpy road of success. She was the director of science division a powerful woman of color with power, at least was given the power. We'll see if the guys accept it or not. That's another story. She came back to Howard, probably, probably for more money. You know how it works. The HBCUs had a lesser salary scale than their white equivalents, so you know, you gotta, you gotta make that money. And then she went on to, uh, she retired, and then she came back as a research uh, associate with the. Uh, National Museum of Natural History with the Smithsonian. So that's basically her career there, in a nutshell, or her academic career. Now, the currency of professors. She wrote more than 50 pubs. If she had been treated better and had more resources, she might have done more, but we won't worry about it. Well, I'll talk about the degree of difficulty later. She taught many, many courses. Entomology, biology, field courses, uh, hundreds of lectures. She was the curator of th that collection when it was at the National Museum of Natural History. She also was in charge of, of the Florida and the Caribbean collections. She was an administrator, she was a director, she was a past president of a professional society, not this one, one in Washington, and she was a mentor and a role model for many people. What Margaret most enjoyed was being in the Caribbean. And there are a lot of images of her in the Caribbean. Now remember that First shot of her on, on bareback on a, on a horse. Now she's <laughs> sitting on a backhoe. So that's uh, typical Margaret. She just wanted to uh, absorb it all. Uh, this is an iconic picture of her wearing her headset with the, the magnifying glasses so she could count these termites. By the way, she worked with nasutes and uh, nasuta termites. These are tiny bugs, right? Yeah, uh, and you know, and she's got to separate soldiers from workers from you know, neo, neo tenex and all that stuff. So that's why the glasses. She was in her element in the field. And by the way, she also owned a 15 acre farm in Florida. So she was a field type to the bone. And when she wasn't out there collecting termites, she was growing food when she could, all right. She loved the islands. More images of her in Guiana and, and Little Caymans and, and this is, this is Margaret. Remember when I told her when she was at Emerson he wouldn't let her do a field study? She said, fine, I'll wait. My turn will come. There it came. She went to the islands more than a dozen times to do what she could do to, to uh, study termites. There are many, many field books. Now, I've, much of Margaret's collection, I don't know how many boxes, double-digit number of boxes. They started at the Smithsonian's. Some went to the American Museum in New York. Some are in warehouses in Philadelphia. 
there's probably boxes there that haven't been opened up yet. So we'll, but some of them have been opened and digitized. This is one of her fill books. She had all these fill books. This particular one just shows two colony, and the pseudotermies tend to be aerial nesters. And if they get too close, they fight. And this is her just, her descriptions in her books about these termites fighting. I already mentioned she, uh, she had a collection. She collected thousands of termites, by the way. Remember little things? When you bust open the net, you get a bunch of stuff. Uh, some of the collections bear her names. These are just some of the uh, uh, countries she, she visited. And, and that Emerson collection at the, in New York, it's over a million, and it, it's a lot. And hats off to Jessica. She's going to sort through all that, put names on it. Maybe someday before I die, I can come there and look at it, too. All right, now, woman in science. Here we go. It's going to get a little bumpy here, and I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Uh, talking to her family members, uh, remember she was a young girl all through grammar school and high school. Young, awkward-looking girl, three to five years younger than most. It had to have been tough. She was in classes that boys normally took. So she had to deal with that all her life. When she wasn't dealing with that in the black school, she went to the, the white school. Some of us had similar experiences. I went to private schools all my life. I went for years where I was the only brown face in the class. You know, So uh, yeah, I survived it. Hopefully there wasn't too many scars, but that belonging stuff is kind of tough when you look around and don't see anyone that looks like you, but you, know, you still persevere through it. She faced a lot of gender discrimination. This was a powerful black woman that, you know, there were attempts to give her power, but what good is getting given power if they don't listen to you? There are some men out there, black men and white men, both of them hated her. And some of you probably, I'm hoping some of you aren't experiencing that today, but it's out there. Um, she was involved, okay, the civil rights movement affected many of us, particularly of my age or older. She did her part for the struggle. They had a bus, boy, okay, there was a Tallahassee bus boycott, not as famous as the one in Montgomery. People still had to go to work. She drove them to work because she helped out for people less privileged than her. She got on FBI lists, she got followed by police. She got bomb threats when she got to give uh, lectures at white universities. Here's a letter, and I got this from the family. She wrote a letter to the editor of the Tallahassee Democrat, a newspaper. This is, it was a two-page letter. And I, I can't put the whole thing there. Complaining about the treatment of Negro citizens in the South. So she was there. You know, she wasn't one of those, you know, closet liberals. She was out there banging the the drum and, and picketing. Uh, the next one gets a little tougher. This is her and her second husband, Herbert Collins. The family related stories to me where they had, and this is in Florida, up there in Tallahassee. They had some nights they had to sit outside their house with, armed with guns, protect themselves from white supremacists, taking pot shots at the house and at their mailbox. Uh, she shouldn't have had to go through that. And while I'm talking about that, let, let me tell you about storytelling in, in BIPOC, black minority families. I'll tell you my story. Uh, I was not raised in the South. I was raised in a combination of Minnesota and Fresno. My grandparents were from, in the, in the, for about six years in, in the 50s, I spent time in Fresno. My grandparents were from Mississippi, they were black, my grandfather told me the story of why his family left when he was 12 from Mississippi. He witnessed a black man being lynched at 12. They left for LA. So my grandfather wanted me to hear that story. You know I told that story to my daughter and I told my, that story to my grandson. So for those of you out there who are thinking that all, and we're going through drama today in America again um, if you think all we have to do is change some text in a book or add a new course, 
or maybe switch presidents, goes deeper than that. Until we can get into the minds and the hearts of a lot of people in this country, we're going to continue to have problems. I'm just... Okay. Because I got, you know, my, my wife's telling, counting, counting me down. I, I got to get through this. All right. So through all this, I asked her son, who's still alive, tell me about your mom. He said she was a great mom. She put family first. What do you mean family first? She didn't always have enough money. Her kids ate first. That might mean she didn't eat kids first. She, she traveled a lot to collect termites. Her first option was to drive so she could bring her babies with her. And then when she did international trips, she made sure she had good relationships with her ex and her, the extended family to take care of her babies when she was gone. Family first. That's important to women. It should be important to men. She was also a great negotiator when you listen to her and a good money manager. She invested. She had property. She gave that to her babies. She was one of those wonder women. The last thing I want to mention on this slide, for all you grad students, postdocs, and professors who don't have tenure, we all have a different path in life and different obstacles, but please, please remember at the end of the day, you got to do the work. Remember that. That's what Margaret did. That's what I did. Got to do the work. Find a way. Let's see. Ah. All right, we talk about DEI or EID. You know, on the Berkeley campus, I still, I'm, I'm retired. I'm still active. We added a J to this, this uh, uh, string of letters. So it's J-E-D-I. So yeah, I'm a Jedi. Oh, it gets better. I told my grandson who was 10, I spelled it out, J-E-D-I. What's that, what's that baby? I call him baby. He calls me Bob. He says, that's Jedi. And I said, you know what that means? He says, yeah, that means you're something like a ninja. Where's your sword? <laughs> Kids, you got to love them. All right. If you go through the newspapers, you can find a lot of images of Margaret from the 50s. Look at this. She's with young black women teaching them how to do science. This is in the 50s, right? So I know we're doing it today, and I'm proud of all the work we're doing, but we're not new at this. She was an artist. She won money for some of her sculptures of a woman. Hmm. And then the last image I'll show you here, and I'm glad we had Dr. Graves talk to us yesterday. That's an incredible talk he gave. Uh, Margaret was the editor. I think you can see her name on there. The book's titled Science and the Question of Human Equality. This book was published in 1981 won an award for best biology book of that era. Let me read one of these sentences to you. This book provides an interdisciplinary look at racism and science, comma, investigating the biological and social reality of individual and group, group differences. Deja vu, 1981. I'll read one more sentence in here. This is a powerful book. When y'all are, are reading those lovely books that Dr. Graves mentioned. Y'all should read this too. Good background. I'll read one more sentence. Any gentleman's agreement not to press the issue is an agreement to leave the status quo alone, comma, and to give it a legitimacy which it may not deserve. Okay, I'll, leave, I'll just leave it. Y'all have to buy the book and read the rest of it yourself. Legacy. One more book here I'll show. I'll hold it up. There's a book out there published, uh, Treatise of the Isoptera of the World. This is one volume. This puppy's seven volumes. This is written by Krishna. And by the way, if y'all want to get this set, it's about a foot thick. You better have a lot of bookshelf. So uh, Margaret's mentioned in there as first author at least 25 times. Another 25 where she's a junior author. This is a publication that's probably going to set the bar for taxonomy and termite biologists for the next two generations. She's in it. Y'all ever heard of Google Scholar? 
do your little Google search. She's still being cited today. That's legacy. She's influenced all kinds of people. On my, uh, looking at it on my far right, Mike Haverty, Jan Krejcik is another one. Uh, there's Barbara Thorne and, and, and Barbara Below. We got Rudy Sheffron, Nanyasu, Margaret, and, and, and Krejcik. And then above, there's a whole bunch of people from the, uh, Arizona. If the termite people know her well, and she's impacted all these people together have probably produced a thousand publications. I have to give you some priceless Mar Margaret images. She is, no, at least to the field community, she is known to be, to carry a mean machete. She had two of them. Her son still has them. These are, these are antiques and priceless heirlooms, and she knew how to use them. She was a great, great cook maybe sometimes unconventional dishes, I'll leave it at that. I have to tell you uh, uh, just two stories. I, yes, I did meet Margaret Collins. I'm old enough to have met her. I met her at her home when I was at a meeting at the Urban Conference. Uh, I'll tell you a little, two little factoids about it. She could read fortunes. So she took my palm and she read my palm, she said I would, have a long life. And I kind of looked, this was in the early 90s. I went, what? Uh, I didn't know my biological mother then. I recently met my biological mother about three years ago. She died at 100 years old. So Margaret was right. The other thing I'll mention, Margaret loved my eye color. And I'll just leave that at that. Uh, Rudy Sheffron and, and them named a termite after. See that? Uh, it's in the suit. They named it after Margaret. You're good when you get a bug named after you. She d did win uh, the Pioneer Award from the Florida End Society, and I, thought, and I thank Richard uh, Malkin for that. He was the driving force behind that one. And uh, the memo Memoirs of the Black Entomologist, ESA publication. Some of you may have read that. She's in there. Wikipedia has all kinds of images of her. Let's see. Okay. And the legacy continues. I get this from uh, Dr. Jessica Ware and Dr. Uh, Megan, let me get the last name here, Megan Wilson. Megan Wilson did this art. So there's an oil portrait of Margaret that hangs next to Alfred Emerson in New York at the American Museum of Natural History. They hang together, right? Thank you for doing that. So that's something that's gonna be around for generations. Some of us probably, this is, those of us who went in the field with Margaret probably like the symmetry of her. And I'll, here's a, a nice great image of, of Margaret. I, I just want to thank uh, to the termite lady for her determination, courage, making a stand for those less privileged, being a visionary scientist, but being a mom first, and most of all, her love of termites. There's a whole bunch of people I have to thank here. The family, Herbert and Veronica, obviously they provided priceless images here. Nan Yao Su for the nomination, uh, bringing forth the nomination. And then Rudy Sheffron and Mike Haverty and Barbara Thorne provided, you know, photos and priceless stories. Eric Riddick. Uh, Winnie Warren wrote that book. If you haven't read that, Black Women Scientists in the U.S. It's a marvelous book. Margaret's in there. You should read that. Liz Harmon at the Smithsonian provided information. Dr. Weska's where, and of course the ESA Awards Committee. And I think I'm done. Thank you. What do I do now? What? I get a plaque? <laughs> For what? Oh, what do I do now? What? what? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm not dead yet. But. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you, Bernard. I'm so moved by that presentation that I'm practically speechless. 
and that is the, the honest truth. Um, I think about how grateful we all should be to the founders um, and to the firsts. And so I, I appreciate those insights. Um, I have a copy of that Kofoid book. Uh, as, a, as a person who's done some termite work and collaborated with, even with Bernard, and there was so much I did not know um, about Margaret Collins, and I appreciate those insights, and I'll, I think I'll be sad forever that I never got a chance to meet her. So I hope everybody enjoyed the presentations today. Uh, congratulations again to all our award winners, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, and stop by all the exhibitors in our booth, in, in, exhibitor booths in the exhibition hall. Thanks so much, everyone.